Hello everyone. Thank you very much for braving the elements today to join us. I hope your drive was not as eventful as some of the other people out there on the road, or should I say on the side of the road. Um, I saw quite a few vehicles in the north area where I came from, um, off to the side of the road. Hopefully you were not one of those folks. Um, we're going to get started here now. And again, thank you again for coming to today's Mac Group Detroit meeting. We do appreciate your patronage. Um, today's meeting is going to be on photos. We are going to take sort of a beginner's approach from this. Um, and this is actually going to be part one of a two-part meeting. Um, next month's meeting, Dan DeRiker is graciously agreed to do the stuff that I'm not smart enough for. Um, and we're going to dig even deeper into photos, but today is going to be photos for Mac, which is relevant to on your phone and your iPad as well. Uh, but we will be going specific onto that. Um, so what we'd like to do is get started with our Q&A section. Um, if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask the group. So what we'd like to do is start off our meeting with our Q&A session. Um, if anyone has any questions they'd like to pose to the group, um, please stand and ask your question clearly and loudly, and we will do our level best to answer that question for you if we can. So, is there anyone with any questions today? Yeah, stand up, speak loudly. Okay. Okay. To the direction, it said to make sure that the phone device is in charge. Device, the lost computer. Okay. And I don't normally wait around to unplug it. So Yes. Yeah, the battery technology inside of that is supposed to not let it overcharge, just like in the computers and in the iPads as well. But the message that you say you saw has me a little puzzled because that's not a message that would come from Apple. And so this, this unit that you're charging with, is this just a cable that you plug into the computer or is this one that you plug into the wall? Okay. USB port. Right. Did you say this is the Oh, okay. All right. That that would explain my confusion. Okay. Because that that's usually if you're going to get a message on this, like the phone or the iPad, you know, telling you to be careful, it's usually this device is not supported, which means that it's not certified to work with your Apple device because on the, on the end of your lightning port, there is a small chip inside of here that helps manage the power flow. And the inexpensive devices don't have the right chip. They've got a, a less than desirable chip and that can cause a problem. So, but this was in your message. So that was probably just someone trying to be safe on, on, the, on the world of, hey, don't overcharge your device. Okay, but your iPhone is set to not overcharge if you're using the proper equipment. So the, do you know, do you recall which brand this is? Okay, so an off brand, not a, your typical name brand, like a Belkin or a Griffin. Or something like that. Okay. Okay. All right. But it, it, the idea of have the the brick or the cable has the illumination. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sort of a neat way of doing things. Yes. Apples. 
but they're doing away with the email chains, supposedly. And well, that's the rumor. That's the rumor. So I was thinking about working a whole power. Right. They moved that we had hardware and security software. Right. So people we had to buy new etc. So are we about to go through that again? Which is all the chip all the computers and you know, I assume that they wouldn't want to say sales computers. That would make sense. Right. Yeah. They so might, they might just say starting next month or whatever Okay, well, along the same lines of your question, um, before we were running the PowerPC chips, we were running Motorola chips. And when we switched from Motorola to the PowerPC chips, it was that situation of, hey, all the new equipment's going to run this, and if you want to be on board, you're going to have to upgrade your equipment. My understanding is Apple is not looking to eliminate Intel out of their systems, but the new chips that they're coming up with are probably going to be used for portable computers, such as your MacBook, your MacBook Air, your MacBook Pro. Uh, the heavy lifting machines will probably still run Intel for a while, just for the processing power. Um, from what I read, the point of Apple developing their own chip, like they have in the iPads and iPhones, um, is so they can control things a little bit better and also try to squeak every last ounce of power out of a battery that they can. Um, with a desktop unit, that's not always the same level of concern as someone on a portable device. So I would it would be my educated guess that we're not going to see a full out and out like we did back at the end of 2005. Yep, we now went to Intel and we're done with PowerPC. I don't think that's going to happen. It'll probably be more of a rollout. And I would think we would just probably see more and more of our devices start to switch over to the Apple-based processing chips. But I think Intel's still there for the heavy lifting side. So it would make sense whenever they come out with this new Mac Pro, which they're saying 2019, 2020, that we would be looking at something that they're saying is going to be upgradable. It's going to be modular in design. So that way you want to swap out a video card, you can. You want to swap out the drives, you can. Um, I would think they also probably wouldn't be against being able to upgrade a processor chip inside of that, but they're not really known for that in the first place. So it would be a good idea, but I think they're going after the power users and they're asking them questions. There was an article that said they were interviewing video editors photographers, music producers, because those are the people that are going to need the oomph that the Mac Pro should be able to offer them when they come out with their new model. The iMac Pro does a good job now, but there are still people that want a lot more power out of their machine than even that puts out. And it might be a real limited market. Uh, but then again, it might just be a market that's ready to explode, too. So I would say, I don't think we're going to see the, oh, we're done with Intel, and within a year from now, everything will be an Intel machine, or will be our own machines, our own processors, like we did back in 2005, and back 91, 92, when we went from PowerPC, or from uh, the Motorola chips to the PowerPC chips. When the, the MacBook first came out, um, 
it was, they announced it end of 2005. And it was a complete surprise to the people that were working in stores. They had no idea, but there was a line of people out one morning looking to buy the new MacBook with the Intel processor. And it turns out Apple had been working on running the system, Mac OS, at that point OS X, um, off of an Intel-based processor. And they'd been doing that for well over a year. And then when they pulled the trigger, it was very quickly and very successfully a good move. So I think we're not going to see, uh, oh, this week you're this and next week you're not. I think it'll be over the course of a year, a rollout. And if they can get the processing speed and power that they need to out of their own in-house chips, well, yeah, eventually, maybe they will drop out of it. So. Potentially, yeah. I, I think Apple's gonna try, and, I would say they they would wanna keep, you know, at least the operating system working with either of them. You know, because we did that with 10.5. Yes, Dan? I thought that was, like I said, role of... Yeah, well, they have their own chips inside of those devices, but that OS is the, you know, the iOS versus Mac OS. So, you know, while your phone and your iPad can do a lot of computing, it the iPad Pro is still not a replacement for the computer. Is it getting there? Sure looks that way. But I don't think it's a full replacement for the computer just yet. Possibility. I mean, there, some people have said that they're seeing a merging between um, the Mac OS and the iOS. And some people are speculating that the iOS may end up running on a computer. So that way everything really is the same. But I would think there's going to be just certain programs that just, I mean, you're not running Final Cut Pro on an iPad. You're not going to run Premiere Pro on an iPad. Just, you're not. It just doesn't have the horsepower that it needs. But on your computer, that's where you should be in business. So I, if they go that route, I'm sure that they're being cautious because they don't want to alienate their entire user base by taking that jump. You know, the MacBook came out and it was three, four months, I think, before they came out with the first iMac that was Intel-based. Obviously, they, they were working on it, but it was just a project and, you know, that they were trying to get completed and go from there. But I, it's quite possible that we will see that in the future. Yeah, every, it's, yeah everything is, you think about where we started, and where we currently are, and there's still so much open space in front of us for you know making everything work on a, a better level. Jim? Yeah, an outsider's view on it, uh, having watched Apple for several decades, um, they they gone down the wrong road several times and backed up and restarted and fixed it. Uh, I'm not in a lot of different areas. And one of the areas that they've done that in is the current traffic. Um, it doesn't have the thermal performance it needs to really do heavy. But there's no way to fix that without a new box. So that's a separate, completely separate issue from what CPU needs. That's almost more of a, of a bus, backplane bus, and data bus. And, uh, graphics processing. So, um, if, if you think that Apple is going to evolve toward a single CPU again, um, 
and you want to talk about the Mac Pro, I would think that they want a working Mac Pro that would sell better than the current one first and worry about uh, developing their high power ARM chips or whatever in parallel, but not even worry about trying to get it into production because there's too many problems just in getting new backplane structure and bus. And there's, there's certainly a market for the high performance systems. And most serious graphic designers don't want to have to change their screen just because they upgrade the CPU. And that's not a knock on the iMac. That just means it doesn't fit the way most people that do heavy duty graphics like to do. They have their screens that they believe are the best screens in the world, and they won't change it. I'm, I'm a small fry myself, and I've had the same Dell 24 inch screen for five or six years. And I don't want to change it. If it dies, I'll get a new one. I've upgraded the CPU three or four times by swapping in a new CPU box. So I understand that mentality. It's a lot like the difference between buying a phonograph and having a hi fi system where you can swap in better speakers for one year, better amplifier another year. Um, so, and that really all revolves around if, how serious they are about the professional market. And they, they have a chance now to prove that they're serious. And I'm sort of looking forward to it. As far as any conversion to ARM processors and mainstream uh, Mac OS, I can't, I can't see that. Just looking at what the production problems are. I can't see that in less than three or four years uh, to, to have it seriously in production. So you know, if you're going to buy a new computer now, I wouldn't even think about what kind of CPU is it. I just think about does it do what I need it to do? And if it does, buy it. Because it'll be obsolete long before they come up with something better. <coughs> yes. Yeah, going back to the feeling. Yeah. Somebody had told me plugs are or they are for you. Correct. The plug itself is just a plug. Um, because we, I would think Apple would want you to use the right charging cable because I can use a charging cable on a USB hub and if it's a powered hub, I get juice. If it's not a powered hub, I don't. So I think that's probably why the chip is on the lightning end and works from there. And that, because your, your power block should just be a power block. block. Um, I refer to it as a brick, just force a habit. That's my terminology for it, whether it's the five watt or the 10 or 12 watt. Um, and the difference between the five and the 10 watt is the device you're plugging it into. The five watt will do your phone just fine. It'll do an iPad mini just fine. The 10 watt is what you want to use, or the 12 watt, um, for your iPad or iPad Pro. Now, my iPad Pro, I was quite pleased to find out, it does have faster charging built into it, which means I can use a 29 watt power adapter from a MacBook, the, the new 12 inch model, and I can use the USB-C to lightning plug and I can charge my MacBook or my iPad Pro in half the time it would through a traditional USB to lightning, uh, which is really, really nice when you want to get a lot of juice in there pretty fast. Uh, so, I mean, it only works with the iPad Pros, the 29-watt block. So if you've got a, an older iPad, it won't do anything except tell you you're using the wrong adapter and you'd have to just go dig out your old one. But it is a nice feature to do that. Uh, you cannot use the 61 watt or the 87 watt. So if you have a 13 inch MacBook Pro that uses USB-C or the 15 inch, that will not 
work with hooking up to your iPad Pro at all. So the 29 does the job just fine. Problem is that 29 watt block is $49. It's real expensive. But if you're in a hurry, it might not be a bad idea. So that's where that is. Um, part two. Okay, so you're looking for an inexpensive program that'll let you do financial stuff between your iOS device and your Mac. Okay, so it should be something that should be able to talk back and forth. I would assume a program like that would probably be something that would be cloud-based for where your files would be stored due to the fact that you're trying to access it on both sides of it because they would want to reach out and shake hands. So how comfortable are you with keeping all your data on an inexpensive program that's cloud-based? Okay, so it is possible that the $150 one might have a higher level of security, because I believe that is cloud-based too. So they talk back and forth. I think, I, I think, I'm not positive, but doesn't Quicken have it for iOS as well as for Mac? Right. So then they would shake hands. Yeah, probably. Okay. Do they offer a trial program on that? Because I, I honestly, that's not my forte at all. Okay. Brian. Oh, so you so you have an option of keeping it on your device, and then through your own Wi-Fi, you can have a private sync. That might not be a bad option to go. I've heard of the iBank program, but I didn't realize that they had a Mac version. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe iBank would be something worth at least looking into. Okay. Another question, real quick. Thank you. Uh, okay, first, uh, related to uh, earlier, I have an older MacBook Pro and the uh, charger cord has both the type of time and the charger cord, but it has to be, they call it MagSafe 1. Okay. It's the 4 2012. Right. Uh, uh, but in the store, they're very expensive. They're seventy nine dollars. Yeah, that's the one. So I'm asking, you know, cheaper, used? No, please don't. Um, what size is your MacBook Pro? Fifteen. Okay, so you need an eighty five watt MagSafe adapter. Because it's a 15 inch, you can't use the 60 because that only is for the 13 inch model. So the um, 
So yes, yeah, seventy nine bucks at the Apple Store. That's where you're at. Um, if it if your computer was not vintage, Apple could replace it for you through the Genius Bar for a cost of sixty one dollars. But if it's a 2011 or older machine, that means it is vintage. They did sell a 2012 15-inch MacBook Pro that used the MagSafe One for about eight months. And so if it was a 2012 model, you could go in and save 18 bucks. Um, I don't recommend the ones on Amazon due to the fact that they are blatantly third party. Um, they weigh half what the real adapter does. And most people that I've seen with it say, well, I got this on Amazon just a few months ago. They seem to have about a three month shelf life in real world using, and then they short out. So I would recommend eBay, Craigslist, whatever, uh, to go that route. Steve? Very often, other where, other where either, the OWC will have the original OEM, real Apple charger at 85, all those for a reduced price. They get a lot of older ones. So very often, they don't always have them. Something worth like other world. Yeah, so maxsales.com. I would give them a shot. Look at their their site and see if they have anything. <laughs> Usually it's in the garage sale that you yeah. find those on sale. Um, so you could look there and yeah, you're probably gonna spend maybe 50 bucks compared to $80 through an Apple store. Um, but those are your options. I don't recommend the, the third party ones because I don't trust them, but that's me. I mean, if you wanna give it a shot and you know, spend the $35 and see if it works. That's on you. And your second question. Yeah, uh, the second question deals with the, uh, there was uh, news about battery life, uh, enhancing the battery life. The controversy I think was that Apple was somehow uh, I have an older iPhone music, but when I plug it in, uh, I charge it up full, and I can barely, you know, I might barely use it, and it's nearly dead now. Strong, you know, it's okay, rapid. So, does that? I can give you multiple pieces of advice on this. You have an iPhone 5, you said. Okay. So if you wanted a new battery from Apple, that battery is $79 for an iPhone 5. And that'll get you back because the battery has, is going to be in one of three categories. It's going to be good, means it passed, means the battery is still holding over 80% full charge capacity. It'll be bad because, well, bad is bad. Or it'll be consumed. The life of the batteries um, on an iPhone, Apple says that those batteries should be good for up to 500 cycles while you're in warranty. You should be able to hit 500 cycles, no problem. Anything beyond that starts leaning you towards the consumed side, which means you just wore it out. That's all. There are third-party companies that offer batteries if you want to do it yourself, and that's up to you. Um, as someone that does this for a living, I can't recommend that you do it yourself. That's all. If you want to do it, hey, that's up to you. Because if you screw up, well, then you are getting a new phone. The upgrade came early to you, and it's on you. Um, but, right, so, okay, so what Apple is doing currently, um, I mentioned this two months ago, I believe. Um, if you have an iPhone 6, 6S, 
6 plus, 6s, 6s plus, 7, 7 plus, um, or an iPhone SE, and your battery life is not where you would like it to be. Uh, one, Apple can run a di diagnostic of your battery over the phone if you call Apple Care. You just have to be in Wi Fi for them to do it. Um, and they can tell you what the health of your battery is and which category it falls in. Um, there's no charge for that. The people that it's been all over the news, Apple said, we're going to run this quality program, not a recall till the end of December of 2018. So this program was supposed to start end of January. It started January 2nd. It runs till December 31st. So if you or someone you know has one of these phones and you think the battery's not up to snuff, you can take it to an Apple store or an Apple authorized service provider to have the battery replaced for $29 instead of $79. I will tell you, you need to make sure you have a backup before you go in. You also need to know what your password is for your Apple ID because they need you to turn off Find My Phone, one, to prove it's really your phone, and two, so they can actually save the repair and go forward with replacing your battery for you. Um, you are looking at most Apple stores, a minimum of a two hour turnaround time for getting your battery replaced. If you go in on the weekends, double that. And that's all there's to it. If you can make an appointment before going in, that's great. You can call AppleCare up and they can even order a battery for you. So that way, when they your battery comes in, you'll be contacted, you get your appointment, and you're all set. And that way you're just killing two hours at the mall. Uh, so that's what Apple is trying to do. Again, this runs until the end of this year. Most people coming in with this um, are finding that they don't need a battery, but they saw it on TV or they read it in the paper or they read it in a magazine that, oh my God, you have to go right now and get your battery because this is going to end soon. One, it's not going to end soon. You've got the, essentially the whole year. So if you want to get this done, you can. Um, as far as your battery being bad. We've had a lot of people come in and their battery is still like holding 93 to 98 full percent full charge capacity. You don't need a battery. But if you go into settings and battery, you can see battery usage. You can see what app is chewing up your battery. For the most part, it's a social media app. For those people that don't do social media and their battery is draining quick, it's either been Waze, the the mapping program or Gaslight, which is always running in the background to tell you the deal on your gas. Dan? Okay. Yes? Okay. Well, I've upgraded all my devices to 11.3. I haven't had any problems. People I know that have done it, they haven't had any issues. I don't know what issues that you've heard of. So, are you on 11.2.6 now? Okay. Right. So she's not going to be there. So if, you, if you're concerned about the update doing something weird to your phone, my advice for everybody in the world is back up your phone and restore it through iTunes. Because, because that'll put it on fresh and then you can move your data back and you're not br hopefully bringing back maybe an operating system that's developing some cracks because usually when someone says, I lost everything off my phone, their operating system wasn't running right in the first place. So that's where we are. So, I just want to follow up on your last 
Yes. Uh, when you mentioned about the apps. Uh, yes. Uh, I have apps that are just being on, and I have chosen called uh, use or uh, when they want to turn on like the locator. It used when I'm using the app. Right. Is that a good alternative or just... It's an 80% alternative. So the reason it's an 80% alternative is, yes, that app should only kick on location services when you've opened the app. Not all apps actually do that. If there's something corrupted with the software, that's like the Gas Buddy app. I had someone come to our store. They live nine miles away. He charged up his phone the night before. He was down to 73% battery in his 10 minute ride from 100%. And we looked and guess what? He was using 76% of his battery. So it's like, okay, here's your problem because your battery is passing at 96%. But if it dropped that fast, this is it. So we restored his phone, put his stuff back on, he was happy that he didn't have to spend 30 bucks. So we do need to get going with the meeting. So quickly. Just quick comment. I did check other words here. Live watch, uh, MagSync, real Apple MagSync adapters, or MagSync one, they have both 22 MagSync And they're all 49 Okay. So 54 now. Yeah, they're out of Chicago. So if you order it, don't do FedEx. Do the, the post office shipping for like two bucks. It comes as just, just as fast as FedEx. What, what, what site was that? MagSales.com. Yeah, okay. Now, some of the other people have said to me, hey, I close out all my apps all the time. That should solve it. It doesn't, because if you've got a corrupted app or the OS is corrupted, even though you've quit out of that app, it could still be running in the background. I encourage everybody to go under location services on your phone and turn off everything you don't need to have running um, because that, oh, that'll that help a great deal as well. So last question. Really not a question. Just sure. A, a shameless promotion. We'll take a plug. Okay. Uh, not that I want to take anything away from photos, but uh, on Saturday, May 5th, I'm presenting a three hour uh, program on Lightroom. So, anybody, it'll be at ProCam Camera in Livonia. Okay. Flyers in the back. Okay, fantastic. So, on May 5th, if you want to learn more about Lightroom, hey, there's a three hour seminar you can hop into. Is there a charge for this? $35. $35. Okay. At ProCam Camera, correct? All right. So, hopefully, someone can use that. Okay. We're going to get rolling here. Because that was a really good question and answer period, but it went a lot longer than we thought. Okay, so today's topic is using photos for Mac. Um, I'm going to touch on features and tips on this. Uh, like I said before, I was, my thought on doing this presentation was to come at it from a beginner's standpoint, because there's always something that you can go, oh, I didn't realize. Um, when I hear like training going on in the stores and there's always something that they bring up that I had no idea. And it doesn't matter how long you've been using the stuff. When the new software comes out, there's always a newer feature that might be a benefit to you. Um, and my understanding is um, from what I've been told by some of the creative trainers is there are some aperture based features that are now being implemented into photos. So um, everyone here knows what iPhoto is, correct? Nodding heads, great, okay. Um, Aperture was the higher end version of iPhoto. It was designed more for professionals. Lightroom pretty much stomped it in the dirt. So that's where a lot of people went to. Um, photos is on your phone, it is on your iPad. And now it is on your Mac because one, it was confusing people 
to talk about photos on their iPad, iPhoto on their computer. Photos has been out since iOS 10.10 Yosemite, and it pretty much has now taken over since iOS 10.11 El Capitan. So, photos for Mac. Pretty much what I'm going to try and tap on today is getting started with using the program. I've created a new user account on here so we can start from scratch. Um, building your library, creating albums. I call it Photo Library, which has its pluses and minuses all over the place. And we'll tap on a few things on that. And then last, I also wanted to hit on storage solution that some people have. Um, because getting into photos is a rabbit hole that some people don't realize, oh my gosh, I've got so many photos now. I've got no hard drive space left. Sort of a good problem, <laughs> sort of a, an annoying problem. So again, this is going to be on Photos for Mac. So before we get into that part, to use all the benefits of Photos, you need to make sure that you have upgraded your machine to the latest version so you can take advantage of the latest version of Photos and all the bells and whistles that they have. Uh, if you are still using iPhoto or Aperture, it is going to have you migrate your data into the Photos program. Depending on how big that library is, this could take a while. Um, most people with, say, a 20 gig iPhoto library, it's probably going to take about 45 minutes to an hour to migrate everything over. If you have a much larger iPhoto or Aperture library, it could take a whole lot longer. Um, and you are stuck waiting for it. I tell people when you do this, let it do its thing. Make sure you don't have to go anywhere because if you stop halfway through, you've got to start this all over again. And another thing is to make sure that you've got enough room on your computer to handle this because you're essentially duplicating your iPhoto or Aperture library into the Photos program. So if you have 40 gigs of photos and 30 gigs of hard drive space left, this isn't going to work. And it's not going to tell you that up front. It's going to tell you that towards the end of it. And so make sure that you've got breathing room on the computer. Make sure that you are up to date with everything. And as always, before you do any of this, back up your data just to be safe. If you're not already doing it, please do it for this one because no one likes to lose their pictures because either A, you're going to spend a lot of money trying to get them all back, or B, you're going to spend a lot of money trying to get them all back. It's all there's to it. Things get screwed up. You're spending money either way. Um, so, with getting started, um, when you want to open up photos and you want to put pictures in there, you have a couple of ways of doing it. You can connect your camera, your iPhone, or a storage device. So, for example, I've got a fairly large flash drive with a bunch of pictures on it that I imported. And when you plug this in, you can import those pictures directly into Photos once you open the program. Uh, you can also migrate from iPhoto or Aperture. So again, that's sort of a, a self-serving way of doing things because it, it should just bring everything right over, including your albums. And that way, if you were doing all that work before, you haven't lost it. Um, there are times, though, when you migrate from iPhoto or Aperture and it finds a file that it doesn't like, it thinks the file's <coughs> corrupted, it won't bring that over, and it'll stop and tell you that, and then you've got to start it again to bring the rest of the stuff over. Normally, it will give you a, um, a file name telling you this is where it stopped. 
So at that point, you can try and dig into your older library and remove that file so it'll go through. Um, a big question I get is, where do my files live? So just like iPhoto, in your user account on your computer, in the pictures folder, there is a library file. The library file is called, I, called Photos Library. Pretty straightforward, just like iPhoto was iPhoto Library, or Aperture was Aperture Library. That's where your pictures <coughs> live. Apple, in their wisdom, has locked that up to prevent people from going into it and pulling files out to go get prints. Um, I will sometimes refer to it as we grandma proofed it because a lot of times people will say, I want to go to Walgreens and get some prints made. So they dig into their iPhoto library, they find their picture and they drag it over. Well, if you're in iPhoto and you're, you find the picture and you drag it over, all you're getting is your thumbnail. So you're getting a low res picture. Well, then suddenly in a moment of brilliance, they go, well, let me dig into the iPhoto library and drag the picture out of there because that's where the original is. But they drag it out of there. They don't copy it. They move it. And so later on, when they go back into the computer and they double click on the photo, they get that exclamation mark, meaning it can't find the original file anymore. When that happens, everything just goes downhill. So Apple, in the last few versions of iPhoto, locked it down to keep people from digging in. They did the same thing with iPhoto as well. Is there a way in there? Yes, there is. Am I going to tell you how to do that? No, I'm not. Because I don't want somebody to watch this on the YouTube site. Oh, well, Dave just said do this and this and this, and it worked. <laughs> no. If you want to know, ask me after the meeting, and I'll show you. Um, and then, how can I learn more? Well, the first place to learn more about this would be the Apple website under support and under photos. There's tons of instruction there from just, hey, look at this real quick, or hey, click this quick video and pick it up from there. So that's one way to do it. Another way is Apple does offer a free service called Today at Apple. Today at Apple allows you to learn how to use any of the programs or devices that you own that are Apple based. So every Apple store has classes on how to use photos. They also are now offering classes on how to take better photos with your phone or iPad if you must. Your phone would be a better option if you want to do that. There's also a class on how to organize your photos. So there's all these tips that you can do, and they're for the very, very best price in the world, free. All you have to do is visit your local Apple Store's website and choose the Today at Apple, log in with your Apple ID and password, and you can book a class. These classes are held in the stores, and they usually are no more than eight people. The reason for the number eight, the tables that they are held at only have eight chairs. So it's going to be you and seven new friends that you're going to make that are going to learn more about your phone, your computer, photos, anything else that you would like to learn. So that is something that I highly recommend if you want to do that. Your third option is right here. We have so many people in this group that know this so much better than I do. We've got all these resources. You can put it on our IBBS board. You can come to a meeting. Someone is always going to be able to answer a question or at least help you dig to find the right answer. So that's where that part is there. Quickly. Yeah. No. So 
the command for duplicate, for duplicate the, the, the image, you're making another one because they're assuming you're going to edit that one and keep your original the way you had it. So that way you're not, it's, because if you take your original photo and you edit it, you are destroying the original. So what they did is they gave you the ability to make a duplicate of it so you could go in and edit the heck out of it and then still have your original should you need to go back. Just because the picture of you and I, you cropped me out of it, you might want me back in that picture later on. So that's why we had the duplicate in there. Why do you convert? You're going to... So you're going to, in photos just like in the last version of iPhoto, you're going to want to export. Export gets you the original file or your modified file, but the original full-blown version of it, rather than just a thumbnail version. So that way you get higher quality. Uh, boom. Okay. What, what about, if still, if you want to copy or edit photo, um, Got maybe right. As long as you don't delete it off of the original as source, as yes. So lots of people reuse their cards over and over. So once it's on the computer, they delete it off the original source, so they have room to take pictures. Because a lot of people, not in this room. Probably, but a lot of people have one card, and they do everything off that one card instead of having multiple cards, so that way they could archive stuff. So you're right. If if it's on the card, you do have it in another location that you get back. But what if that card goes bad or gets lost? Then you then you don't have that card, and you don't have those images. So the ability to duplicate a, an image so you could use it in a different manner and still keep your original one, I think was a good idea. Yeah, but that's that's our uh, Blue? Right. Right, but yeah, but any kind of memory source has possible to go bad. I've had a, 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 a almost brand new Lexar, and the Lexar is about as good as you can get. Fail. Okay. I mean, I hadn't had a week. I couldn't. I, I would. Yeah. I treat SD cards or compact flash cards. The same way I treat a hard drive. I know it's not going to last forever. I'd like it to, but I, I know it won't. And you know, when I have to tell somebody that their computer died in their in their or their hard drive died in their computer, you know, I always look and go, you know, hard drives are like people. They don't last as long as you want them. And when it goes, you're going to cry because you are. That's all there's to it unless you don't like that person. That's a different stop. Um, so backing up, again, is always our mantra. So you don't lose that stuff. Because if you do, you're going to spend money trying to get it back. So if you have the ability to have backups multiple locations, you're doing yourself a favor. Right. Am I actually importing them at that time, or am I just looking? You're just looking at them. So they're still on the card, but not on the Not yet. I save it. Yep. So yep. Important. Right. And I'm going to walk you through that in just a second, and that just to to show you. Okay. Um, Okay, back where we are. Okay, so 
the first thing that I am told, everybody that gets into using either iPhoto or Aperture or Lightroom or Photos now, is once you start into this, you suddenly start taking more and more pictures. And way back in the days of film, we were much more selective about our pictures. We made sure that we've got a good shot or this is a pretty good shot and we're in pretty good shape. Now with everyone being able to do digital, now we are just taking pictures left and right and knowing that, hey, the pictures of my shoes, I can throw those away and not feel bad versus, oh, I just took five shots on film of my shoes. My shoes are not that special, but I just wasted five shots. With digital, you don't, I don't think anyone views it as wasting shots. I mean, yeah, I can take up space on the SD card, but like these, like it was said, you can delete them off the SD card. You know, if you don't need them, dump them. Um, and photos, just like iPhoto, let you import your photographs and your videos. So I get a lot of folks that look and say, well, I imported all my pictures off my phone and now my computer's full. And I have to explain to them that these pictures are only a certain size, but those videos, they're more like boulders when it comes up to taking up space. And if you have a 15 minute video of the kids playing baseball or soccer or something, that can take up a whole lot of space on a computer. And the computers that people are getting nowadays have smaller and smaller hard drives. They are faster because they're solid state drives, but you, you go in this Apple store and buy a MacBook Air, it starts with 128 gigs. 128 gigs? Okay, I've got a MacBook Air that had a 64 gig drive in it. I didn't store anything on that computer for that very reason, because there was no room for it. So yes, for $1,000, I get a MacBook Air with the 128 drive. For $1,599, I get a MacBook Air with the 512 drive. Okay, now we're getting into the neighborhood of storage. But for $1,100, I can buy a 21-inch iMac with a terabyte drive. It's not solid state, but man, I've got storage. So for a lot of people that are getting into photos, Maybe the desktop's a smarter move than trying to juggle everything outside of your MacBook Air or even your MacBook Pro. So you've got something to consider when you are purchasing that device or the device you already have. Lou? Two terabyte drives. Drives. Mm hmm Right, yeah. So, but that's for external storage. Yeah, okay. So, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, all right. Um, there are a ton of editing tools inside of photos. And again, when you want to export a photo, that's what you want to choose, whether you're emailing it, whether you're sending it through messages, or if you're moving it to a drive to take to Walgreens to get your prints made. So those are really good options there. Uh, this is, I was looking for a picture of a big stack of photo albums that I think everyone has in their house someplace. Um, I know that my wife has our wedding album in the closet. Used to be on the coffee table for years and years. And now it lives in the closet. And her goal one day is to scan all the pictures to have digital copies of them. So that way if the house burns down, it won't be the end of the world. But I'm sure everyone here has probably seen this at their own home or at least a relative's house where people are collecting all this. So what I want to do real fast second here.
So I'm opening up photos for well the second time today. The first time I tested it and then I threw the library away, which is why it's walked me through this. So right here in the center of the screen says take a quick tour of photos. If you haven't used it or you've upgraded and now it's there, I encourage you to go through that and see some of the things that you can do. You're probably going to look and go, yeah, I did that before. I did that before. Oh, okay. Well, that's new. Oh, yeah, I did that before. So even if you get one out of 10 things that's something new to you, hopefully it'll be a benefit to you. So I'm going to click Get Started. And what this does, this brings up your library along the left side, which lets you view it in different manners. Um, I always have to convince people that when you've created an album, an album is just a link to the photos library. So if you delete a picture out of an album, you're not taking it off the computer, you're only taking it out of the album. But if you delete the picture out of the photo library, you are taking it off the computer and out of your album at the same time. So something to consider. So what I'm going to do, similar to what Chuck was saying before. So I plug my phone in. Man, that new screen is really nice. So the temple got a new um, projector and a brand new screen. And from the back of the house, is that nice and sharp yeah. back there? Okay. That's a lot better than the screen that was yellowing before. So I've got 562 or photos on my phone. If I want to import every single one of them, I would click the blue box in the upper right hand corner that says import all new items. I don't want to import all of those photos. I want two photos out of here. I want this one and that one. So now it gives me the ability to import the two selected photos. I have a thing for Volkswagens. So that's why I'm picking those two. Yes. From the source, which is the phone. Right. What happens? Are they from the phone? No, they are not. I've copied those over to here. So if I come back under devices, where it shows my phone, the pictures are still there on that phone. Now, some people will set photos to open every time you plug in your phone. I personally find that annoying. So, at the top here, Maybe. yes? Remove the photos. Yeah. Already imported. They're copies. Yeah, so the, the photos copied to my iPhone, or to my photos library. If I check this box up here, Every time I open photos or plug my phone in, photos will open. Because I don't like that feature, I'm going to make sure it stays unchecked. And that way, if I want to import something, I'm going to have to manually open photos, which to me is not a big deal. In that, Some people, they want to import everything onto the computer immediately, so they will have that box checked, so that way photos will launch right away. So I've done that. I've imported it. So at this point in time, I'm going to unplug my phone. So now I've got the picture of this Volkswagen and it brought the metadata over. I took this picture probably with an iPhone 4S. No, 3, 3GS because it's from 2008. That, I took that picture with that phone. That picture has come along with me all the way up to my latest phone. Nice thing is, it came along with the metadata because it's showing me October 1st, 2008. 
Now, if I want to bring some other pictures over under File, I can go to Import. And I created a folder called Test Pictures. And I've got a bunch of different images in there that I wanted that I can either bring over everything or I can just bring over certain ones. And I even have a couple of movie photos. So this is my Scotty. His name is Macintosh. <laughs> my wife gave him the name. I didn't suggest it because I thought she would say no. She thought it was the perfect name. Um, she grew up with Scotty's. This is not from today. However, he did look like this earlier today. Um, this was from a while ago. So, but you see that it shows the import. So that has my imports because I'm under imports. If I go back up to photos, it tells me that that picture was February 10th of 2010. So the metadata comes over with that as well. You can bring over more and more pictures the same way. Now, let's say I want this picture of the Volkswagen and I want to take it to Walgreens and get a print. I've got a couple ways to do it. The simple way for most people would be to choose File, Export, and then Export One Photo or Unmodified Original. If I had edited that photo, but I wanted the original, I'd choose the second one. So I'm just going to stick with that one. It's going to ask me some basic things about how do you want to export it. Okay, JPEG works for me. Bringing over the, the title, the keywords, and description. Okay, I could check the box for location information, and it should bring that metadata over as well, but I'm not going to right now. And then it's going to ask you, where do you want it? Okay, I'm going to choose desktop. And now it's told me that one file has been exported. If you are moving a chunk of pictures, it goes pretty quick. Um, if you, you could do 100 pictures in probably under two minutes. If you're doing more than that, it obviously take longer. But that's a nice, easy way to move those things in. Now, right now, it's viewing these three pictures under moments. If I go by photos, it just moves them like that. Moments is what allows you to separate them from when they were taken, rather than just a, here's all your pictures all in one spot. Years gives you like this, like on your phone, if you dig into it, and it puts them all in there, and it knows, okay, the 2008 and 2010. Collection is quite similar to moments in my opinion. But if I want to see under imports, hey, yep, these are the ones I've imported. Once I quit out of it and come back to it and import more, these won't show up in the recently imported anymore. They will just show up as part of my library. Does that make sense? So go back up to there. Um, you also have the ability to go in and create albums. So if you want to make an album, you hit the plus sign. And you can decide, is it an album, is it a folder, is it a smart album? I'm going to go with just album for now. Yeah. Think of it as a search. Yeah. So 
if I have an album, if I have a smart album named VW, and I have a bunch of car pictures, and then I, I assign a keyword to those pictures, and let's say one of the pictures says Corvette, it won't move that into the VW album. Because as she explained, it is looking for that keyword that is tied to it. And you can add a number of keywords to put it, make it a smart album. So similar to a rule, I would think it's a type of rule. So that way it just knows, okay, everything I'm gonna import is gonna do this. Includes it. Displays it. Displays it. Displays it. Displays it. Displays right. Displays okay. So, smart, smart, thank you. Smart folders, smart playlists, smart searches don't move anything. They just change how they look. Okay. So, it, it's better for organization? Correct. Okay. Not necessarily organization, it's better for work. Okay. So, you can have smart. Of your Volkswagen, of jewelry, of folders, of things. Okay. Yes. The other choice was folder. How? How? Folder. So, let's find out. So I think a folder, I could take my albums and put it inside the folder. Yeah. So. Perhaps. No. Yeah. No. I'm Oh, that'll let me create the album inside of the folder. Okay. Does that make sense? Everyone else good with this too? Smart albums. Yeah. So. So a folder, you can have multiple albums inside of it, whereas an album is by itself. So if I take that, hold down shift to get the other two. So what I did is I'm in fold photos. I highlighted both the pictures of the Volkswagen and then I dragged it on the folder or the album and I called it bugs. So now if I go here, I see both of those. If I go there, I just see the one picture because that's a separate album. So again, these are, I, I hate to say it, sorry, these are beginner steps, but these are things that maybe people haven't done before. And for our viewers, they'll be able to watch these steps and hopefully learn something from it. Um, So, if I choose this photo, I choose edit, this will let me go in and play with a number of different features to give it a, the photo a completely different look. So, that let me brighten the heck out of it. Because I'll be honest with you, I didn't realize that SUV was behind the Volkswagen until just now. Because I my focus was on the, the car itself. But when I really brighten it up, to me, it makes it stand out. I can also, I'll go back to the middle. 
So if I want to kill, play with the color, I can definitely do that. And I can really make that yellow pop, it looks like. Will this drag? It will. I like that. Oh, that's the charm. So I can also make it look like a newspaper print. That looks pretty grainy. So I can slide that to go for whatever effect I'm going for. But if I uncheck that, that takes away the black and white, and puts me back in the color. So you, you see the blue check boxes along the right side of those three sliders? So if I do that, I'm back into black and white. But I don't want black and white, I'll stick with this. When you're through playing around with that edited picture, if you save it to then you've kept the picture still there in form. Now you've got Edited. Right. So that would be the modified version. That's how Apple calls it. Uh, yeah. Um, I would think so because I do have the option to revert to original in the upper left corner. Okay. Correct. Okay. So on your picture card, you had a long number. No? Then when it was called something, blah, 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 uh, then. Right. Sure. And so you gave it a new name, and now it has after you saved it, played with it, colored it, edited it, then you saved it. You gave it a name, but the original, until you delete it, still has that Okay, so taking your advice, I duplicated that picture because, you know, I'm not making any money off of this, so I'm not worried about losing an image because I still have it here or on my phone. Um, So that's the original here, and that's the one with just a slight modification to it. I could go crazy and modify even more. So, uh, crop. So I like the stop sign but I don't need all this parking lot in front of it. That really makes the rust pop out even more. Probably. I don't think it'll fit. Besides, this one has a sunroof. Sort of caught my eye. Okay, so these are just, these really are baby steps on using the program. There's so much more that you'll be able to do. Yes? Yep.
it should ask you, this is already here, it should, do you want to, do you want to import this again? Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes it will give you a, a, a duplicate copy, but it should, see, depending on what you're importing it from, I think that's probably the biggest issue. So, right. So hang on. Let's import it again and see what it does. No, it didn't. So it, it did import it again. So now you have it on there twice. And now you would have to, you know, if you've got multiples, you'd have to clean it up and go that route. Okay. Because I know some things will, hey, you've already imported this. Do you want to replace it? So apparently this is not doing it. Okay. Right. Okay. So let me hop back to this. So in creating albums, we created an album, we created a folder, we put an album in the folder and we added pictures to it. So that walked us through a couple of steps there. Organizing your pictures. Okay. You can, once you have them in an album, you can move them around and place them where you would like them. Maybe they're out of timeline, but they might flow better for what you're, the album that you're putting together, especially if you're looking to put it together as a slideshow. Modifying an album, pretty much you've opened up an album and you've decided that your crazy great aunt doesn't need to be in that family picture anymore. So you're gonna remove her from the album, okay? If you remove her just from the album, you'll still have her pictures and photos. She just won't be in the album anymore. So you'll still have them should you need to put her back in, maybe to get in her will. But then again, maybe not. The biggest question I get from most people is, what do I do with all these pictures? My first statement is always, back them up. Just in case. Just back them up so that way you've got them saved. The next thing is, well, you're sitting on an airplane. Instead of watching a movie, why don't you organize them, make some albums while you're doing that or in the car? Because you don't need an internet connection to make that happen. So these are options for you. Um, but organization is probably the one thing most people don't want to do because I know growing up, there were shoe boxes under the bed filled with photos that never made it into an album. And it's the same thing here. People have all these pictures on their phone. They offload them onto the computer to make up room on the phone, and they still don't have any. So what you do with them is your choice. Um, you can either be organized or you can be a digital hoarder. Take your pick. It's all up to you. Um, one of the really neat features that's out there, depending on how you trust the cloud, is iCloud Photo Library. That allows you to sync all your pictures to iCloud from all your devices. So let's say you've got 10 gigs of photos on your phone. You've got five gigs on your iPad. And you've got 100 gigs on your computer. Well, you can't have all those pictures if you have a 32 gig phone or a 64 gig iPad, but with iCloud Photo Library, it will give you the ability to view all of those pictures from any of those devices anytime you've got an internet. So, that is a quick description of what iCloud Photo Library can do for you. The drawback is, 
the generous amount of five gigs of space I, Apple gives you for iCloud backup, you will burn through that in no time at all. But you can purchase additional space. So if you want to be that person that carries all your pictures around, you can be selective and you can use the 50 gig plan, which is only a dollar a month. So for 12 bucks a year, if you've got less than 50 gigs of photos, man, you've got everything at your fingertips anytime you want. If you need the 200 gig plan, that's $2.99 a month. Okay, so 36 bucks a month. Okay. If you are a spendthrift and burning through money like nobody's business, please adopt me. But after that, you can get a two terabyte plan for iCloud, which used to be the one terabyte plan for $9.99 a month. So that's 10 bucks a month, 120 bucks a year, but that's two terabytes of space. So if you are somebody that needs to have access to every single picture that you have, that might be a good way to go for you. Another feature of going that route is if you are doing family sharing, you can now share your iCloud space with other people in that family sharing. So I have the 200 gig plan and I gave my wife 10 extra gigs. I gave my daughter 30 extra gigs because she likes to take pictures. And I can give either of my sons space too if they want it. They both have said no don't want to do it, but I still have more than enough room for whatever I want to do. So that is something that family sharing can offer if there's, you're in a family situation and you want to share that space instead of my wife spending a buck, me spending a buck, and my daughter spending a buck. Well, I'm still spending $3, but now I've got 200 gigs instead of 150. It's not a bad way to go. And as the person that's organizing it, I can decide who gets how much space. And that works out really, really well. So when you set up family sharing, it allows you to send an invite to them. If they accept it, I can then say, okay, I'm gonna give my wife Barb 10 extra gigs. I can give my daughter Alyssa 30 extra gigs. So that way my wife now has 15 gigs of space, my daughter has 35 and she can keep taking pictures all day long. Um, so do you need additional iCloud space? Yes, you will. If your library is more than the five gigs, which that'll happen rapidly. Um, the biggest question I get from people is what happens when I delete a photo? Is it gone from everything? Yes. Yes, it is but it's gone from everything after 30 days. If you delete a photo, if you're using iCloud Photo Library and you delete a picture off your phone, it will pull it off your phone right then and there. But it's up in the iCloud Photo Library <clears throat> excuse me, for 30 days. So should you want to get that picture back, you can go into iCloud.com, log in with your Apple ID and password, and at that point, go to Photos, find the one you want, re-download it. Give me a second. That's better. And then the last question is, are my photos safe? Apple goes to great lengths to make sure your privacy is respected and protected. However, people have stupid passwords. If you are a person with a stupid password, your photos are only as safe as your password is smart. Um, so the harder to guess password means that you've got more security, but that goes with anything in life. Your password should be something difficult. Easy enough for you, maybe, or use a password manager to help create a difficult password as well. So, yes, your photos are safe, 
but only based on how smart your password is. Okay, storage solutions. Let's go back to that 128 gig MacBook Air. And you have an 85 gig iPhoto or photos library. And you have 200 megs of free space left. Computer's running slow because of it. How do you get them off? Okay, you've got a couple of options. Uh, on older computers, it's easy to upgrade the hard drive. On the new computers, it's not so easy because it's no longer a two and a half inch box on your laptop. Now, because of the SSD, it's a, as they say, a blade drive. It's a board that plugs into the logic board and that's it. It's super skinny, but to replace them, it's very expensive. Um, the 64 gig MacBook Air that I, excuse me, talked about, I replaced it with a 256 gig drive and had a lot of room on it. And I was very happy with that. But that 256 flash drive from MacSales.com, OWC, sells for over $300. So it's, if you have a solid state drive in your computer, it is expensive to upgrade. It might be price prohibitive for most people. That's where an external solution kicks in. External solutions, a lot of people will come in with the hard drive and move their, or their photo library to the external drive. And to get it to show up on your computer when you open photos, if you hold option, when you click on photos, it'll give you a sub menu and ask you, what library do you want to use? And you can then point it to the external library and it'll work from there. That's a nice, easy way to do it. The drawback is if someone opens photos on your computer without that hard drive plugged in, it creates a new photos library on your computer with none of your data, which can be confusing to a lot of people. So you may want to consider that. Um, so if you've got a lot of them and it's on a portable, you just need to keep in mind the drive has to be plugged in before anybody opens photos, whether on purpose or by accident. Brian. Well, there's that too. Yeah. Not letting someone else use your computer is always a good option. Um, and then last but not least, deleting unwanted items. Now, when you delete photos off your phone or your iPad, they get moved into a recently deleted folder. From that folder, you can go in and say delete all, and then they are completely flushed off the device. Lots of people say, but I deleted 300 photos last night and I still don't have any space. And when I show them the recently deleted, I'm like, well, there's your 300 pictures, and here's your other 600 pictures that you were deleting before, that, oh, they're on day 28 of 30 days. So they're gonna disappear soon, but not soon enough. So you can flush them out that way. You can also do the same thing on the computer. If you delete them off of your photos library, they're gone. With them being gone, you've now freed up the room. But again, back them up first before you do that, and then delete them. Okay, next month, our topic, Dan Riker is going to do so much more than I was able to do today. He's going to show us some stuff in photos, but in particular, he's going to show you what you do with your photos once you've created something with it. And he is going to show us how to order a book from the, um, Apple. And these books are really, really good looking. You can also order calendars through there. You used to be able to order greeting cards, but I'm not sure if that's still a function or maybe it's the postcards they took away. But we will learn more about that next month. So please come back next month and bring someone with you.